with President Muhammad Buhari's administration having less than a week to go. Nigeria is growing up for Bola Tinubu's government. The president-elect, whose campaign slogan is Renewed Hope, will be taking on issues which this current administration hasn't been able to solve. One of such issues will be around fuel subsidy and other related issues in the oil and gas industry. The All Progressive Congress Presidential Campaign Council in the past said the incoming administration of Ashua Yubola Ahmed Tinubu will decide when the first subsidy will be removed. Also, due to the many challenges confronting the Nigerian oil and gas industry, there have been calls for an alignment in regulatory activities between the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission and the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority. Stakeholders have argued that the misalignment between the two key agencies of the oil industry had created an overlap that had caused them operational risks and resulted in discouragement to investment in the industry. Joining us on this morning show right now to discuss President-elect Bola Ahmed Tinubu's plan to revamp the oil and gas industry and ways he can address the issues plaguing the sector is Bala Zaka, an oil and gas expert. Welcome to the morning show. Thank you. Well, first, let's start with where we started from this morning, the Dangote refinery. Yes. The IOCs said no, they, they don't want. But we have seen Alaji Aliko Dangote and his group providing leadership. What do you think is the significance of that and this connected issue of fuel subsidy removal? Because this is a private sector initiative, major investment. How do you see a connection? Well, generally, uh, parents feel happy when their children are doing fine. You know, and uh, in the context of, of, of leaders and uh, governance, uh, leaders will be very happy if individual and corporate citizens are doing fine. Uh, Dangote refinery or Dangote management is, is a corporate citizen. What Dangote has achieved is... I hope you are not suggesting that you are a parent. <laughs> well, no, well, that's why I say government <laughs> leaders, yeah, yeah, you know, before leaders, yeah, you I'm know. So what, what has been achieved to me is worthy of, of praise and, and emulation. But I must make it very clear, as far as I'm concerned, provision of goods and services is the responsibility of government or leaders of nations. Because leaders are citizens that are citizens like you and I, you know, elected and handed over their economic, political, and social destinies to manage in national interests. And to that extent, it is the responsibility of leaders to take care of individual and corporate citizens. And when you talk about uh, provision of goods and, and services, fine, Dangote is a private initiative. To me, private initiatives are not after the provision of goods and services because they love citizens. They are after profit maximization and cost minimization. But... I mean, uh, cost minimization and profit maximization. And if in the process there is a need for human resource to aid them, they do that. Because as far as I'm concerned, if somebody constructs a factory or an industry in, in a community and that, 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 that investor, of course, is a private initiative, he didn't or she didn't do that because they love the citizens. They did that because based on their feasibility studies, they are likely going to maximize profit and minimize cost. Then for Dangote, of course, is, is something great for, for Nigeria, is something great for the West African sub-region. I also feel it's something fantastic for the continent of Africa and the global oil and gas industry, especially the, the, the downstream. But... When, when I hear people say, oh, Dangote is coming to, to solve the problems of, of downstream sector in Nigeria, I, 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 I tell them to, hey, hold on, hold on. Nobody is even asking where Dangote got the funds from. As far as I'm concerned, you can get the funds from either of two, 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 two sites, either from creditors. If Dangote got the funds from creditors, Dangote must pay the cost of debt. The only way Dangote can be able to do that is for Dangote to maximize profit, minimize cost. And if Dangote got the funds from shareholders, dividends must be paid to shareholders. And the only way to do that is by maximizing profit. But at the end of the day, 
Dangote initiative is going to help in bridging what I can best describe in this context as energy sufficiency or energy gaps. That's what, because the refinery will take care of the liquids, you know, well, excluding the, the cooking gas, you know, it will take care of liquids like petrol, diesel, kerosene, aviation fuel. Then the petrochemical is going to take care of so many other things that will help in boosting our GDP. But we should be at the back of our minds that private initiatives are private initiatives. At the end of the day, they will comply with their civil responsibilities of paying taxes and levies. That will help the revenue. Which, which I totally agree with. But private initiatives are private initiatives. National initiatives must come from government and leaders of nations. All right. Um, now, looking at that, from your statement, a number of people have questioned the government's, particularly the government's plans towards the refineries. Now, looking forward in terms of Ashwa Ajwala Metinubu's tenure, should there be a focus then on repairing our own refineries by the government, or so as all as some people have said, it should be concession to private sector, as you know the Dangote refinery. Because we had talked about it earlier on that he had said it yesterday, or before I actually mentioned it, that in his speech that he wanted to buy one of the refineries, but it didn't go through, and so he had to build his own. Would you think that would have been a better, perhaps, um, arrangement whereby there's a public? private partnership, rather than the government taking ownership of these, you know, the Potakos Wari and um, Kaduna refinery, refineries, as opposed to that, for them to work with private sectors, organizations like um, Dangote Refinery to achieving this? Because that's part of what we'll be looking at in the next administration. What's well, going to happen to our refineries? Well, thank you for that question. And that brings me to where I notice this, this dumb argument, you know, when you're discussing with people you thought are technocrats, but they are probably pre-singers, you know. And I'm saying this because I noticed that when you really discuss with so many people, as far as restructuring mechanisms are concerned of nations, many people don't know the difference between deregulation and liberalization. If you ask them the difference between commercialization and privatization, they won't be able to tell you. And that's why I hear people saying the telecom sector was, was, was privatized or was deregulated is not correct. But I don't want to dwell on that. I just want to tell you that as far as I am concerned, it is the duty of government to have state-owned functional refineries or refining facilities. In the days of Gaddafi of Libya, state-owned refineries were functional. If you go to Iran, they, they exist. If you go to Iraq, if you go to Malaysia, if you go to Saudi Arabia, if you go to Indonesia, if you go to Qatar, they exist. I have not heard about a barrel. A barrel is, of course, the unit of, of measurement of crude oil. I have not heard about a barrel of crude oil being stolen in the Libya of Gaddafi, or in Saudi Arabia, or in Malaysia, or in Qatar, or anywhere. I have not heard about a pipeline vandalization in any of these countries. As far as I'm concerned, state-owned refineries work, and that's why they are there. And when I hear people are saying, even if we were to have our own uh, functional refineries, state-owned refineries, they're supposed to be supplied crude at international price, I get surprised also. The international price has to do with cartel. Cartel comes in because there is a need to pr protect members. Local consumption has nothing. The way a manner they take care of their respective internal domestication concerns have nothing to do with the uh, philosophy of the cartel. That's why even when you talk about crude oil, you have the quantity that is regulated by the cartel for sale to the international market. And that's why our condensate is not under the control of the cartel. But when I hear people saying, even our, uh, the, the crude oil must be supplied to look, no. But for Dangote, because it is a private initiative, you have to do that. The commissioning was done yesterday, fantastic. Now the next thing will be the practical crystallization of activities. Yes. I will expect to see refined petroleum products that we technically call distillates. But another thing again that I will say is this. As far as I am concerned, the next question for industry watchers like me is, now we need to convey and deliver crude to the refineries. How do we intend to do that? Are the pipelines ready for uh, delivery? It's a question. If we're not going to use pipelines, are rail lines 
and wagons available and if we can say work in progress when will that happen are we going to use tankers and trucks and if we're going to use tankers and trucks what happened to the already existing congestion on roads like Lagos Ibadan Expressway and the kind of soil chemistry that we had in this part of the country and what we are seeing those are the kind of things that will concern okay. people like me. Okay, so that those are conversations around ancillary development, you know, pretty Correct. much if you Correct. have to probably use the ports, which Dangote has built a port in there to be able to get product in around that. But I also want to talk about the marginal dislocation of our oil industry. Uh, Dr. Patti said something that caught my fancy. He said the IOC said, oh, they are not going to play a role, but Dangote has stepped in. But when you flip the script, the first refinery built in 65 was built by an IOC in this country. Shell. That's Correct. Shell. Shell Correct. Daisy. Correct. It was built by IOC. But all of a sudden, we have become from a country where IOCs can stick their investment bets on us to a country where IOCs cannot touch us with a long spoon. We said, okay, we've passed the PIA. No. And we all know it's still suspect as we speak today because nothing has been implemented. Correct. Dangote cannot totally be a silver bullet. How can we have an ecosystem where we have a lot more IOCs ready to stake their bets like they did in the 60s in this country? Well, you see, the answers are not far-fetched. Whether you talk about the IOCs or local companies, they are suffering from what I can technically describe as business climate hostilities. And, 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 and they, they are all there. I mean, and at the point I had people saying the reason why they are leaving the country was because they are divesting. No, they are actually running away, looking for better, cheaper, and, to deeper and, waters and, 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 and safer investment heavens. I mean, as, as at last month, you can't believe it, Angola overtook Nigeria in terms of crude oil production. The whole crude oil reserve of Angola is not up to 15 billion barrels. The whole gas proved, because there's a difference between proved potential and probable. Proved, well, yeah, proved but reserves. the proved reserve of uh, Angola in terms of gas is not up to 15 trillion cubic feet. And as I speak to you, quote me that I said, in Nigeria today, we do not have up to 15 active drilling rigs. And any country that does not have up to 15 active drilling rigs like Nigeria, you don't need anybody to tell you that you're not going to meet up with your opaque quota. So we're not only talking about the midstream does not even exist in Nigeria. Quote me that I said so. So the downstream, we know what's happening. So even the upstream is suffering. The midstream does not exist and the downstream is in shambles. Okay. We'll have uh, a new administration coming in very Correct. soon. And in his uh, statement yes. at the Dangote Group event, the uh, president said, oh, he's very optimistic that the Chinobu administration would build on what he calls an enhanced business environment. I don't know whether you agree with him. No, I don't. But what are those specific reforms that you would like the next administration in Nigeria to carry out in the oil and gas sector? And I started by drawing your attention to the fuel subsidy crisis. Correct and whether there is a connection thereof or not. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the biggest mistake, the quote me that I said, and, and let time, history, and posterity judge. You see, in discussions like this, to me, you know, it's not a discussion of us versus them. It's a discussion of us versus us. In discussion like this, I am after sharing and making sure we, we, we share and cross-fertilize knowledge. But most importantly, in discussions like this, to me, talk is not cheap. Talk is a commitment. Talk is a bond. Because long after you are done and gone, it records will be there. Where are the Greenfield refineries that we were promised? Where are they? We, we can't see them. Before the removal of subsidy, a liter of diesel was like about 80 Nigerian Naira. We were told that once the subsidy was removed, there was going to be competitive pricing. We're going to see investors and the rest. Today, a liter of diesel is close to like 800 Nigerian Naira. Quote me that I said, there are no investors. Let anybody prove me wrong. The only thing we have experienced has been 
the collapse of strategic industrial sectors, collapse of strategic commercial sectors, and the collapse of domestic, I mean, strategic domestic sector. And strange enough, even the Finance Act, the only thing we experience about the Finance Act is just adding and increasing taxes. Even people, those who were supporting the government and the finance bill and acts, have seen it now. So the biggest mistake, the coming regime, whoever the Almighty will crown, effective 29th of May, 2023. You, you have a doubt about that? No, I said effective. I don't know who will be crowned. And I said, whoever the Almighty crowns, you know, effective that day, the biggest mistake that person will do is to remove subsidy on the price of the only remaining product. Nobody will show us the, 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 the values we have de derived by removing subsidy on the price of aviation fuel, apart from mass sack, mass cancellation of flights and delays. Nobody will show me anything that we have gained from, from even the removal of subsidy in the price of kerosene. Sometimes I hear people saying, we are not doing well because we are a monoproduct economy, and I ask, is Saudi Arabia a, a die, tri, uh, tetra, penta, hexa, a deca product economy? The answer is no. Is Indonesia a, 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 a deca product economy? The answer is everything is based on the initiative creativity and dexterity of, of leaders, whether people accept it or not, as far as the down, I mean, the oil and gas industry is concerned, whether you're talking on land activities, swamp, shallow waters, and deep offshore, we are experiencing leadership mismanagement and leadership docility. And it's not going to take us anywhere. Act, show me one OPEC member nation that has comatose refineries. Show me one or No, you see, the mistake everybody is doing is this. The biggest mistake anybody will do is to compare Venezuela with any OPEC member nation. Venezuela is confronting a superpower. That's a political conflict. You said so I should show you. So okay, I show okay, you show me, but I've given you the reason. What Venezuela is going through, if Nigeria were, were to experience one-tenth of that, Nigeria will be wiped out of the map of, 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 of the globe. I mean, Nigeria has and been... what will happen to us? What? People what? like us. Okay, what will happen? No, and, don't, uh, don't put I, I can't even explain. We have been reduced to a country of melancholies because this is a country where you produce so much beans, but if there is a need for you to buy a car, you go to somebody who does not even cultivate at all. We have been reduced to a country where you produce so much cassava. If you need cassava flour or gari, you have to go to somewhere and meet somebody who does not even cultivate at all to so, buy. So, Mr. Zaka, we have an opportunity for progress in the next tenure. Correct. Shwajibala Metinobu would oh, I hope hopefully so. be um, inaugurated as president on on the 29th of May, um, 20, so that's on Monday, 2023. What he has said as part of his oil production plans, he's, had, he's given us very big plans for that. He's looking to taking Nigeria back to over 2 million barrels per day in terms of oil production. In fact, he's pegged it at 2.6 billion um, barrels per day. Of course, you would understand why analysts would become quite pessimistic about that in Including terms of the circums circumstances. And that's what I'd like you to speak to. Number one, is it realistic? No. Number two, for, for it to be realistic, because we used to produce in, I mean, in the 2019s, we used to produce over 2 million um, barrels per day. Correct. If it would happen, what ought to be put in place? Because what we want to do is to see the possibilities of it happening despite prevailing circumstances. Then I want you to speak to that vis-a-vis the global decarbonization plan, because that's what a number of people are saying, that we're looking to increase production whilst the world is looking to alternative sources of um, generating power. And so oil, in, a, in you know, some years down the line, would no longer be a major player. I mean, it would take a lot of years for that to happen, but the world is preparing for that already. What's your take on Let this? Let me start with decarbonization. And I want to ask a simple question, very simple question. Will there still be road construction? Will people still ride cars? Will there be cars? Okay, what happened? Will you require bitumen during construction? How do you get the bitumen? By the time those people answer those questions, I mean, we will be done and dusted. I can tell you, 
As far as I am concerned, when people start, a lot of those who are selling these ideas to you, petrol is not part of their problem. Basic electricity is not part of their problem. You know, cooking gas is not part of their problem. But you're talking about a country like Nigeria with all the endowments. Okay, look at the recent discoveries around Gongola Basin, you know, Kolmani. Recently around the Benue Trough, you know, uh, Nasarawa State. Even the Lagos. Lagos belong geologically to what we call Dahomey Basin. It is within Nigeria that you will know that it is not the volume of endowments that you have, but it's the creativity of your leaders. You're talking about a country of 200 million citizens, right, apart from the strategic sectors, relying on less than 10,000 megawatts of electricity. Do you expect anybody to tell you that you will run into energy crisis? You're talking about a country where the last time Nigeria constructed a refinery was in 1990 or 1989, 34 years ago. Do we need anybody to tell us that we're going to run into energy crisis? When we went into uh, poly, um, democratic governance, you're talking about 24 years. Even if it will take 10 years to construct a single refinery, Nigeria should be having two at least functional refineries. But what we keep saying is this. Nigeria is a member of that cartel called OPEC. Okay. Right? Why, are, why are, okay. are other OPEC member nations not having similar problems? Okay. Okay. Nigeria is a member oh, of I, gas so exporting okay. countries forum. In terms of um, re how realistic, two points, and what, what No, it's, it's not place. going to be realistic. It's not possible because... So it's not possible I, at all. I've it's no, not no. because I've told you about the, okay. the number of rigs at yes. the moment. Okay. Yes. I mean, it's not going to be realistic. We've never produced over 2.5 million barrels per no. day. Never, ever. So it's not going to be realistic. A uh, couple of questions. Now, let's talk about, and just to fact check you, I was just teasing no you when I said, no worries. when I said Venezuela, Venezuela actually has working refineries. In fact, they have the, the third largest refinery in the world. And we knew what happened world. to Moduro. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but. And I, Hugo no, Chavez. No, so let's talk about, you know, subsidy now. What now happens to about the 11, you know, uh, trillion subsidy bill? Let me answer it. The first question Very is, please, but, 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 subsidy is a globally accepted economic pain cushioning concept. Subsidy is not a Nigerian concept. And if subsidy does not work in Nigeria, that will never invalidate the universal relevance. And let me give you a practical example. The only reason why you have the Nigerian army, even though they were not those who killed Shekau, you have the Navy, civil defense, you have the security agent, is because there is a need to provide subsidy in security. The only reason why you have uh, teaching hospitals, federal medical centers, dispensaries, is because there is a need for government to provide subsidy in health. The only reason why you have public universities, polytechnics, and secondary schools is because there is a need for government to provide subsidy in education. Okay, so land on the point. So What's I, your take I, on it? I would want to do it. The biggest mistake this government will make yeah. is to say they will not provide subsidy okay, in so energy. Well, no, I said you. that uh, Balazaka, yes. after June 30, or is it May 29, as we've been told, we'll be facing uh, debt to service ratio of over 40 trillion, ways and means of over 22 uh, trillion, serious debt. So if we don't remove first subsidy, who is going to fund that subsidy you are arguing the, for? Okay, the question is this. What would have happened if we didn't even have crude oil at all? Mm. Yeah, that's oh, the question yeah, you will ask. What if we didn't have crude oil at all? Thank you so what much. What would have happened? Like Thank you. Are Thank we going to go into time. slavery and extinction? Thank you Put so your much. thinking caps, the next generation of leaders. Well, Mr. Bala Zaka, oil and gas expert, it's been good speaking to you this morning, looking at some of the plans of the next administration in the oil and gas sector. Thank you.